This is Smarter San Diego TV. You said you've been talking to scientists, people who have solutions. Mm -hmm. What needs to be done? Eight plus billion dollars mm -hmm. in profits in three months, but they won't admit that it's happening. Should women be allowed to become Navy SEALs? The short answer is no. You lived there oh for my four gosh. and a half years and you didn't know? <laughs> so the government now, very, very invested in the mortgage industry. What's happening in China that no one knows about, the news isn't covering, Tell us what's going on. I'm in the naughty corner today. <laughs> like you said, you're not getting rich in the military. you got to come up with a way to build some wealth. Real estate, best way to do that. I mean, can it still be fixed? And how serious is it really? And if so, what do we need to do? And now, here's your host, Derek Evans. Welcome to Smarter San Diego TV. This is the place where we get smarter and it's all commercial free. Derek Evans here, your host, of course, my co-host, Rebecca Peters, in the house on the new couch. Oh, what's up? How you doing? I'm feeling very good right now. You're the first person to sit on that it's couch. nice and cozy for anyone who's going to be here on the couch. It's comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if I'm going to make it through the next hour. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, let's get right to Ask SS3 yes. TV, our questions of the week this week. Of course, you can send your questions to the email address on the screen. If you have them, we will try to answer as many of them as we can on TV. We will answer all the questions off the air for sure. Uh, let's do those because we have a great show today. Amazing guests coming on the program today. Aisha Sunesia would be here with mm -hmm. Tahir Body. We also have the mayor of Carlsbad coming on later. So I want to leave as much time for that as possible, but yep. let's answer your questions right now. Okay, so Mark in El Cajon would like to know what happens if I don't think I'll ever be able to afford to buy a home in San Diego? Are some people just stuck being renters forever? Uh, no, no, pe not everyone is stuck being a renter forever. Okay. Not, there's no one who's destined to be a renter forever. There's hope. There is, uh, and it's okay to be a renter. I'll tell you right now, it's not the end of the world. The key is to make sure that you're always paying equity some fashion. So in other words, when you buy a home, Part of your payment that you're making is going towards the equity of the home, which means that one day you'll have it paid off. You can do the effective same thing as a renter as long as you're putting some money aside every single month into an equity fund or a savings account, whatever you want to call it. As long as you're doing that, then you're, you're still paying into what will eventually be your paid off house. So if you are doing that, you're okay. So if you are not putting that money away every month, that's the only time I'm gonna have a problem because that means that you're not actually making financial progress towards what we would call a comfortable retirement. Mm -hmm. So a comfortable retirement is where you don't have to make a house payment, you don't have to pay any rent. Imagine if you took that payment off your books, how nice things would be. Well, that's what retirement's supposed to be like. So Mark, as long as you are putting some money aside every month for your equity fund, start as early as you can, put, put as much away as you can, then it's okay to be renting don't get anxiety about it, don't worry about it, uh, but just know that one day you do want to buy a home and the best time to buy is when everyone is saying that real estate sucks, so wait for that time and then buy. Next one. All right, taking notes. Michael in downtown would like to know, who would win the election if it ends up being Trump versus Clinton? Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your answer on the record. Smiley face. But, yes, by the way, Michael has been listening to the radio show for years. He always asks me questions like this. I love it when he does it. Um, the interesting thing between Trump and Clinton is that they are sort of the front runners right now on both mm -hmm. sides. Um, of course, there's been a lot of support brewing and building for Ted Cruz recently. Uh, he did really well and won the Iowa caucus. Um, but the reality is the people will decide. Um, I think what's going to happen if you end up with Trump and Clinton on the final debate stage going into the election, <laughs> what you're going to have is you're going to have you know, Hillary saying, you know, this guy embodies everything that um, is bad in America, greed, capitalism, corporate, Wall Street, all that. And Trump is going to say, <clears throat> hey, if you want more of what we've had the last eight years, vote for her. If you want something completely radically different, vote for me. And the people will decide. I don't know if Trump can do it. Um, Clinton is a very good politician. Mm -hmm. She does not seem phased by him whatsoever. I would not want to campaign against Hillary Clinton. She knows more than he probably does about how to win elections. If you look at between her and Bill, how many elections they've won. Yeah. They have like a really good track record winning elections. So I think it would be very difficult for Trump to beat Clinton. So Michael, the official answer, as much as I don't like it, is that Hillary Clinton would probably beat Donald Trump in a general election. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> All right, I better get my jacket on. It's time to start the show.
next guests on Smart to San Diego TV are here to talk about the bigger picture in life. Please welcome back to the show psychology professor Aisha Sineja and professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego's School of Medicine, Tahir Bhatti. All right, welcome to the show. <laughs> What's up? How are you guys doing? Really good. Good. Great to have you here. You should welcome back to here. Welcome for the first time. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for coming. I know you guys are both very busy. Um, very interesting subject today, and I'll just be honest with you both. I don't understand it that well. I know you hear about it all the time if you're doing self-discovery or you're reading books about uh, enlightenment or spirituality, you're going to hear the word self-love, okay? And that's uh, something that uh, a lot of people hear that and they go, that sounds kind of kooky, right? Like self-love, like of course I love myself, but this is like a deeper idea, right? Because for people like me who don't quite understand it, what does it mean to really you know, love yourself? Does that mean you're in love with yourself? Does that mean that you're narcissistic? Mm. Or what are, what are people talking about when they say self-love? Yeah. You know, Derek, that's a great question. Um, you know, the way I look at it is self-love is about doing things that really bring you joy, that bring you happiness, that really help you connect. Um, and the difference, as you were saying, between being narcissistic about saying me, 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 it's all about me, it's really closing you down. It's really kind of constricting you or contracting you. And when you're loving yourself, you're opening up. You're allowing your heart to open. You're connecting to other people. And you can see what's happening to the people around you. So if you're being narcissistic, you can see people are going to be maybe upset or antagonistic. You're not knowing why people aren't doing this or that because you're so important. But when you're truly loving yourself, that love kind of flows out of you. And people being kind and gentle and really connecting to you. So self-love is a much more heart-opening experience. Narcissism is a much more you know, heart-closing experience, if that makes sense. OK. So then, Aisha, how do we begin to open our heart then in that regard for people like me who don't necessarily understand self-love. What is this all about? I mean, how do we start? Well, self-love, like Tahir said, is um, definitely about loving yourself and being kind and compassionate. But I also think, you know, take it one step further and you think about being really honest, uh, brutally honest with yourself and taking a lot of accountability and responsibility for your life. So when uh, someone maybe is um, narcissistic, you know, we think that they're really loving themselves, but the truth is there's very little self to love. Narcissism is more mm. of a, a fraudulent state. Um, it really is, a, yeah, a lot of insecurity and sometimes kind of deep-rooted um, so inadequacy. It's a, a mask for the reality that's it going is on. A mask, yeah. It's Interesting. Really, and then real self-love um, comes from a sense of humility, which is the exact opposite of narcissism, right? And I just want to talk about humility just for a second Please. because you know, in our culture, we think that being humble really means we're not, you know, not seeing ourselves as being worthy or good. But true humility is not just knowing your strengths, but it's also recognizing your weaknesses and not being in denial of maybe some things that you could either accept about yourself or perhaps change. So we can just start with saying, well, self-love is that state of being humble and seeing your strengths and your weaknesses and finding that balance of what you want to accept and change about yourself. It's a difficult thing, though, isn't it? Because you know all the dirt on yourself. Yeah, that's true. You can hide it from everybody else. It's true. But that your, your uh, as we called before, your dark thoughts. The mm-hmm. thoughts that you have that you would never share with anyone are the things that come through your mind in your, in your worst moments, you know. Um, you know about those things. Isn't it harder maybe to love yourself than it is to love anyone else? Mm. Absolutely it is. You know, I mean, th- it's a great point. The fact is that I think that's part of loving yourself, is really accepting who you are and being kind to yourself. So when these negative thoughts, these dark thoughts come in, you have a choice. Do you want to bring in more thoughts or kind thoughts or positive thoughts or even just saying, it's okay not judging yourself, because we get in that negative loop then, and then all the thoughts just start building in that negativity. How can you break that and say, you know, this is okay. Everyone has those thoughts. And can that just be okay? Can you hold on to yourself in a kind and a gentle way? I think that's what self-love is about too. Not just doing things that bring you joy, but really monitoring your thoughts. And about meditation that helps you kind of calm down and be in that space of peace, that's a way, that's an act of self-love. Hmm. You know, so it's different things you can do, even with your own thoughts, that help you with that. So things like <coughs> nourishing yourself, hmm. uh, the the diet, uh, hmm. the exercise, mm-hmm. the things like that. That's that's a form of self love. Huge. Okay, because I think that's where a lot of people could start with something like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. You know, is recognizing that hey, you know, this is this is my body. Yeah. Uh, I need to take care of it. I need to take care of myself. Absolutely. Uh, that'd be a good place to start. I think people could understand that because you do get sort of an instant gratification from that. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. Whereas it may be difficult conversation to have with yourself when you start having those dark thoughts. <laughs> right, and you're like, right. Okay, Tahir <laughs> said that <laughs> it's okay <laughs> for me to have these thoughts. That's true. Even though it's still scary for me. <laughs> um, but it's true. You, you are not your thoughts. I think, Aisha, I saw you post something like that on Facebook. You aren't mm. your mm. thoughts. Absolutely. You're the witness. You're the observer of the thoughts. I think when we get, we have problems, we get so caught up in our problems and lost in our problems, we're not actually looking at the problem. So that's what you're saying about being the, the observer. But you're so right. I think, you know, when you are in a place of self-love, like you mentioned, you're taking care of your body. You know that saying, your, your body is your temple. Well, what are you feeding it? How are you taking care of it? How are you nourishing it? Um, what are you watching? What are you listening to? Who are you interacting with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Those are all very conscious ways of self-love. And uh, to hear you mention meditation earlier as being a form of self-love. And what's interesting to me about meditation is most of the people that I talk to, I say, have you tried meditation? Hmm. They say, yeah, I tried, but my mind's just too crazy. I can't do it. Right. Yeah. And so, right? I that have, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of people say that. And just for everyone to know, like, I'm one of those people. Like, I'm always, think I overthink everything. Mm. I need to meditate to just kind of get rid of all those thoughts and just focus on one thing or just nothing. Chill, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just relax. Well, yeah. if you think about it, having all those thoughts is sort of like mental diarrhea. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what it's like. I have mental well, diarrhea. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so what, what, what happens when you have physical diarrhea? It usually means you ate something bad. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're having mental diarrhea, Perfect. what does that mean? You know, what are you feeding your mind? Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're feeding your mind lots of stress and, and, and toxic things and negativity, then of course Absolutely. you're going to have that mental diarrhea. Yeah. But if you look at what you're feeding your mind and go, okay, I'm going to feed myself more meditation, mm. more yoga, more peace, more time to just sit there and not do a thing, whether yeah. you're meditating or not. Just sit there and don't do anything. Just look at stuff. Right. Um, all those things sort of feed the mind and help mm. it clear itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's also something that people could do to sort of take a step in this direction. Because I, I'm the same way. I'm, I might be the same as you. You know, I hear self-love and I go, oh, come on, that's tough. You know, that's too hard. Right. How can you love yourself and you know all these things about yourself? <laughs> uh, but you can take steps in the right direction, right. which help guide you that way. So I don't know if you guys know this or not. I probably haven't told you, but I'm doing yoga five times a week now. Oh, oh that's great. Nice. Fantastic. Five, so five days a week I'm doing yoga. And I think, I really do believe that yoga is, is the solution for a lot of the things mm. that people mm. have as ailments. Uh, because the body is extremely complex. Yeah. Right, Doc? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> the Absolutely. body is, it's <laughs> crazy how many tendons and muscles and bones and mm. neurons, just all these crazy things that are going on. Right. Uh, and cells, the tens of trillions of cells in the body that are all harmoniously working together. Well, yeah. you have to somehow exercise that. You have to somehow massage that. You have yeah. to somehow treat that. And if you don't, then obviously it's not going to work in an optimal way. Absolutely. Right? Self-healing. This is very self-healing, what you're talking about. Doing things, yoga, allows your body to maximize this innate healing potential we have. You break a bone, you get a cut, you do nothing to make that repair itself. That happens just organically. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're maximizing that potential to allow healing in your body. Yeah. Yeah, love it. It's pretty cool stuff. It is. <laughs> so, um, you have a question? question yeah. Go ahead. Kind of backtracking to negative thoughts, when we kind of overwhelm ourselves with negative thoughts, mm. how do you differentiate between it's okay and I should probably do something about this? Or do we need to do anything about it? Well, the way I would look at a negative thought, what we would consider a negative thought is, is it healthy or is it unhealthy for me? Is it causing me stress? Is it helpful? Is it going to actually make things better? Is it going to improve my life if I keep thinking this thought? Or am I just ruminating? Or am I problem solving? And then finally, it would be, um, am I actually, um, you know, am I growing? Am I evolving? Am I learning something from this? Or am I just kind of stuck and kind of getting in my own way? And we often do that with negative thoughts, right, where we're kind of getting in our own way instead of, um, growing or learning from the thought. So I, I know what you're saying because sometimes we say, well, if I just accept and love myself, then how will I ever learn and grow? How yeah. will I ever understand that this thought might really be negative and it might be really um, hurting me? So what, what would you say about that? Yeah, I'd that? say that, you know, as part of being kind or loving to yourself as well is if you need help. I mean, there are always people you can go see, a, a therapist, a counselor, a doctor, a psychiatrist, if you're finding your thoughts are really bothering you, or a family member, or a dear mm -hmm. friend. Don't feel like you have to be isolated with your own thoughts, because again, that's narcissistic. I can take care of this myself, I'll deal with this, but it's really connecting and reaching out, which is more loving, I need help, I need to go talk to someone. Maybe someone else needs to evaluate this to see if I need help, and they can help you along that path too, because again, loving yourself is connecting. When you're having that thought in the opposite way, you're disconnecting, being by yourself, that's being more hurtful, as Aisha was saying. 
Yeah, I think yeah. that's another thing that's really hard is just asking for help mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you need it. And that's because that's part of self-love, which people have a hard time with. So the uh, and I would add to that great advice from these two, obviously. Yeah. I would add to that to ask yourself, is this real? Mm -hmm. How how real is this thought that I'm having? Because so many times the thoughts that we're having are projection in the future, mm -hmm. uh, something that has never actually happened and probably won't actually happen. So if you if you ask yourself, you know, is this real? No, it's not real. Most of the time, the answer will be, this isn't even real. This is just my mind. Mm -hmm. This is my mental diarrhea again. Mm -hmm. This is not <laughs> real. So if you can say that, for me, that helps me a lot. Once I realize it's not real, psh, and then I can just drop it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll work for you. Maybe it won't. But something to just consider. Uh, in that line. And so we started with the idea of the difference between self-love and sort of narcissism or you know, where the ego lies. Um, to hear, I think your explanation was great, expansion versus constriction. Um, but how do we know, how does a person know, because when the ego takes over, right, it sort of like tells you whatever it wants you to, <laughs> to hear. <laughs> exactly. How can we identify if we've gone too far maybe in this direction? Mm. You know, it's, it's a great point because I think everything's about finding the middle path or finding that middle way. So it's kind of like what the Buddha said, right? Yeah. Is that you can go to extreme on either end. So you can say if you're giving, giving, giving too much and you're taking care of everyone else, you're like, oh, this is self-love. And we're all these caregivers. A lot of people go to that spectrum. Instead of being all just take care of myself, they go to the other end. So it's really about can you find that middle path that makes sure your health is well, you're eating well, you're sleeping well, your energy is good, then you have the ability to take care of the people. It's like the old analogy of the plane, the mask falling down. You know, you have to put your mask on first before you put the mask on your child because if you can't breathe, you're not going to help the child or yourself. So it's really about taking care of yourself first and being a little bit selfish in a positive way. Great stuff to hear. Aisha, did you have something you want to add to that? Yeah, actually I did. So uh, another way to kind of see what's happening um, internally is to kind of pay attention to what's happening externally. So if people are coming to you and in your life and you're finding that people are not loving you, you feel like people are not respecting you or they're not accepting you, they're judging you, a lot of times what you check in, what you'll see is you're not accepting yourself. You're not loving yourself. You're not. You're judging yourself too too harshly, or being too critical of yourself. So we often look from others what we're not giving ourselves. So if you find in your life that you feel like you know my my partner or my children or people in my life are not loving and respecting me, I think it's a great time to check in and say, Am I loving and respecting myself? Fantastic point. In fact, I just read recently in the Yamas and Niyamas by Deborah uh, Adele, which is about the ethical practice of yoga. Mm -hmm. She said you tend to treat other people the way you treat yourself. Right. Mm. So yeah. if you're really hard on yourself, chances are other people are <coughs> feeling the whip. And I've found nothing to be more true than that statement. Guys, thank you so much for coming today. I oh. really appreciate your time. You guys are amazing. Thank Look you. forward to having you both yeah. back. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else, commercial free. <laughs>
They're doing a lot of collaboration dinners. There's just a lot going on. Or maybe people are just getting so drunk they need to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the problem. That might, that might be it. Yeah, that could uh, be the driving force. That, right? That's it's a good like reason. People are drinking so much. Yeah. It's like, oh, time to eat. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> you gotta eat before, and then yeah. you gotta have your post drunk meal. Well, I, mean, yeah. I mean, there's a point in time here in San Diego when you think about the Ballast Points. I mean, for uh, for uh, those of us who've been here long enough, Ballast Points started off as only a tasting room, mm -hmm. and now they're this twenty thousand square foot facility with beer coming, barley coming down a train on the backside of their warehouse and dropping off barley to brew. Now they have a restaurant, a clothing store where they're selling yeah. like souvenirs. So I mean, to think what these breweries started off doing and then now to be where they're at, yeah, I think it all revolves around food. Now as you get bigger and bigger, you're like, well, God, if I have four beers, I might need a burger after that or I might need some french fries. So I think what they've done is kind of steered the market towards that kind of design. And of course, where they put these places, obviously uptakes the real estate investment, uptakes the market, kind of makes the surrounding areas that much more popular and that much more of an attraction for people to want to be at. Yeah, because people have been saying for a long time, North Park's the place to be, mm -hmm. right? If you like to eat, mm -hmm. North Park, Hillcrest, yep. um, live in those areas, you'll be able to walk to 20 different places. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that makes it a very desirable place to be. Mm -hmm. The editor of this magazine, um, you probably see a lot of this stuff that we don't necessarily see. I mean, are you just like, oh my gosh, I have to eat there. Oh my gosh, I have to eat there. Oh my gosh. Are you all over the place eating? <laughs> There's a lot of exciting things that are coming along. A, a new restaurant's about to open next week called Trust in the new Jonathan Siegel building on Park. So that's over on the Hillcrest North Park University Heights border. So yeah, there's new stuff opening every day. And uh, yeah, the, the chefs, the movement of the chefs and people, you know, where they're going and their inspiration, the farm to table movement, uh, influenced by the slow food movement has been really something here because San Diego's known for our farms. We're known for those organic farms like BY's, like Chino Farms, that famously feed a lot of restaurants uh, up and down the coast and around the country that they the list Chino Farms right there on their on their menus. Yeah, I've been seeing Susie's Farm and yes. stuff like Crow's that. Crow's Pass. Listed. It's so interesting because the, the movement 20, even 30 years ago was about fast food. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. give me fast food. I don't care, you know, what's in it. Just give it to me if it's cheap and fast. And now we're kind of going the opposite direction. Now mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, no. I want it to be as healthy as possible. I'll wait for it. People mm -hmm. want an experience. And I'll pay for it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that is a big change. It's exciting. It's exciting. And I think uh, with the advent, with the internet and with food television, there's been a lot of education on how much goes into great food and how important it is to know where your food is sourced and there's been a lot of great chefs here locally that have worked hard over their careers. Andrew Spurgeon's one yep. who has done a ton for, for slow food. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot of great people in one spot and uh, a lot of people who are inspired and taking it to that next level. I mean, I, I remember back when I was in the industry, this is 10 years ago, 12 years ago, back in San Diego. And there was this thing we started called Cook Confab. And it was Andrew Spurgeon, Christian Graves, uh, Antonio Frisia myself, Amy DiBiase, there's a handful of us, maybe 10 of us, that we started this, we, they, they tended to start, to want to start this movement of all natural, slow food, true to the origin, keep the nutrients within the, the product that we're trying to heighten. And now we've taken that concept 10, 12 years ago to this worldly thought that, wow, why don't we just eat the food that comes from the farm, straight from the farm to the table? which. I mean, Rebecca's been doing this for thousands of years in England. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they don't really spend too much time in the supermarkets. You go down to the corner store, you go down to the market, yeah. and it's just carrots from the local roadside farm. And of course, you know, we got to talk about the Little Italy Mercado and the farmers markets. You know, we have so many farmers markets locally, I love it, yeah. and the populace is is going every week. I think there's more than ten thousand people at the Little Italy Mercado every Saturday. It's pretty incredible. We do give out our magazines at the market. And uh, they're also in uh, PB on Tuesdays and uh, North Park on Thursdays. So those markets are really incredible. You can meet the farmers, you can see your different produce every week as it's seasonal, and you know you're getting that fresh, fresh, fresh produce. So when we see these new restaurants opening, a lot of them are sort of like conglomerate groups mm -hmm. or you know stuff where it's like these people who figured out how to make restaurants work and make them profitable. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of mom and pop stuff 
that's going on. Is this just like the perfect time or the best time ever to open a restaurant in San Diego? That's a very good question. There are a number of restaurant closings. So there has been a saturation mm -hmm. point. Uh, okay. Croce's closed last week. Uh, Aqua Al Due closed uh, this week. Uh, El Callejon. And these are restaurants. Wow. Aqua Al Due have been around 15 years. El Callejon for 22 years. So there's been a sort of a perfect storm of uh, a very, very busy restaurant market and how many consumers can go and frequent these places on a regular basis. So the savvy, uh, you know, groups have, re you know, they're busy seven days a week. Yeah, they figured it out. Yes. Yep. So Larry, how does that play into desirability for where people want to live and ultimately, you know, real estate values? Uh, when buyers are looking to buy, I'm sure this is on the top of the list. Well, yeah, well, I mean, we see what's happening down in Little Italy. I mean, we've got, what, in the, in the next couple of years, we have four projects scheduled to be built or finished at multi-million dollar type deals. I mean, the BASA building with Pacific Gate, and then you, mm. they have three other buildings that are going up in the same vicinity. You have other developers that are just booming. So with the influx of these multi-million dollar properties, obviously what comes along with that is what's accessible to those properties. And the, the thing that people most want when they're buying a million dollar condo is accessibility to wine rooms, accessibility to restaurants, accessibility to parks, accessibility to public transportation, places where they don't have to necessarily get down to the basement of their building, get in their car, get out of the building, get by the gate, get stuck in traffic and drive two blocks. So I think as we start to see San Diego develop with North Park, Hillcrest, um, South Park even now is kind of they're on the, it's coming the up, man. they're on the tail end of the North Park reboom, right? So there's no more room in North Park, right? So where do you go now? Now you go to South Park, and so from South Park all the way down the hill into into that east side of uh, downtown is now getting redeveloped with you know the the Garden Yard or whatever they're calling it, the open Bottega Americana, that area that's getting redeveloped. So as these areas get redeveloped, I mean you're seeing restaurants go in them first and breweries and bars. And then guess what comes next two or three years later? These big developments, these, these condos, these affordable homes. Um, so I say, if you're out there and you want to buy a home and you want to be in the place to be, find where your favorite restaurant is and is not too populated. Or if it's one of those like Buena Fochadas that used to be in South Park, it was a standalone by itself. If you want to buy over there, I'd say buy now before the influx of 10 or 15 different restaurant groups saturate the market and now the value of the homes go up at least 5 to 10% just because of the accessibility of what you have. It's an disposal. interesting idea. Mm -hmm. If you have an area where there's a busy restaurant and it's been there for a while, mm -hmm. but real estate values are still down, there's places like that in Golden Hill, Yep. by the way. I was going to say Golden Hill is uh, yeah. coming up. That's well, I mean, I'd say indicator. buy now. Yeah, buy, buy now. right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Get in there now. These, these restaurants have proven that there's enough people there to keep them going mm -hmm. for a long period of time. They still have lines out the door. That might be an indicator this mm -hmm. is a great place to buy for an investment. And, and I think the next generation of home buyers, the millennials that are actually starting to look at it and start to think about what, what's my long-term investment and, and real estate becomes their target, they want to be places where they can walk, where they have accessibility, where they have the ability to not get in a car, waste gas. You know, we're seeing the trend now towards vegan restaurants, health conscious. Um, and more of a fast food way, but it's still the healthy version of eating. So they're riding their bike to the store, they're riding their yeah. bike to the bar, they're riding their bike to the restaurant. So where is it in these desirable areas that they still have the ability to buy affordable housing? And I'm saying, you know, right now I'd say South Park, you know, east of Adams Avenue, east of the 15, like South, you know, Kensington, North Parkish area is still a, still a good way. The one that I kind of say is under the, the blanket and the hidden gem of San Diego is Oceanside. It's still one of the only places in San Diego where you can find beachfront property for under a million dollars. Um, and with the influx of restaurants and bars mm -hmm. and things that are happening down on the Pacific Highway and Mission Boulevard, it's only a matter of time before those things start to skyrocket. And so it, if you if you want to live somewhere where it's you want to be part of the boom, you've got to find where the new restaurants are going. And when those new groups open these restaurants, um, I'd say find out where they're planning to open their next restaurant. Say, I'm going to go move there and get your home at, at the value where it's at now. And then just watch it multiply and multiply and multiply. Fantastic advice. Great stuff, uh, Larry, Josh. Appreciate you guys being here so much. Thank you so much Thank for your you. time. And stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else commercial free.
Our next guests on Smart to San Diego TV are here to talk about a sizzling hot topic in Carlsbad, Measure A, which is up for public vote soon. Please welcome to the show Matt Hall, the mayor of Carlsbad, and of course our good friend, Mr. Carlsbad, Brian DeVore. They're here. What's up, guys? How you doing? How you doing? All right. So, hey, Measure A, it's a big deal. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. Mr. Carlsbad, you as well. Absolutely. Uh, who better to talk about this big deal in Carlsbad right? than Mr. Carlsbad and the mayor of Carlsbad? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We've got everybody here we need to talk about. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, Measure A, for people who don't know what it is, some people I know have already voted now uh, because of the absentee ballot thing, but for people who don't know what it is, what is Measure A? Measure A is a project that's about 203 acres in size. It's on the south shore of the Agua Hediana Lagoon, mm -hmm. and will uh, I-5 will be one the west side and Cannon on the east side. Okay. It's a project that will have about 27 acres of high-end retail and dining and about 176 acres of open space with a farm-to-table a restaurant and a market. Okay. So it sounds like it's, and where is it located exactly? It's located in Carlsbad, just east of I-5. Just east of I-5. On the Cannon off-ramp. Cannon off ramp. So that's is that where the strawberry fields are right now? It's the strawberry fields. Yes, the strawberry fields. Okay. So yeah. that for anyone who doesn't know, you you yeah. probably know where the strawberry fields are. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we're talking about here. And 200 plus acres is huge. That's a huge amount of space. Um, so people are kind of torn here. We did a little Facebooking, and a lot of people are against this thing for some reason. They're very much opposed to Measure A. It seems like um, it sounds like everything's great. But I'll give you what some of the people are saying. And you can kind of tell us, is that true or not? So a lot of people are saying, well, what about, do we need a mall? Do we need another mall? Carlsbad always had, already has such great shopping. Do we really need another mall? What do you say to people who, who say that? Well, first of all, I don't put this in the same class as a mall. This is going to be a very different experience. The actual footprint of the project is about 26 acres. Only half of that is actually consumed by the buildings themselves. Mm. There's going to be a huge promenade places for people to gather, places for people to eat and dine while they look at the lagoon. There's going to be over three miles of trails. It really is the best of both worlds. Somebody who wants to shop, it'll be world class. Somebody wants to experience the lagoon and the open space, it's going to be world class. Okay. So for the environmentalists then out there who would say, just leave it as it is. You know, it's, it's untouched, just natural beauty in Carlsbad. We want to keep it just as it is. Uh, what would you say to someone like that? Well, right now, 154 acres is zoned open space. In that open space, there are a lot of uses. You could build a city hall there, you could build an aquarium there, you could build a cemetery there, a whole host of uses. What this developer proposes to take that 154 acres combined with another 22 and really put it into a natural state. 60 acres will be for the strawberry farmer, Mr. Ikugawa. The rest of the land, he is going to take out the evasive species, revegetate it, and truly take it back to a natural state. That is a $16 million gift to the community. Wow. Wow. Okay. So a very big deal then, of course. You don't get $16 million gifts very often. Do you, Mr. Carlsbad? <laughs> Not, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I, say, I haven't either. I don't know what's going on in Carlsbad, but uh, maybe I need to move up there. Um, okay. So I'm trying to figure out where the cons are here with this thing because you know when new developments come in there's some obvious benefits that come with new developments whether it's residential or commercial in this case um, what about traffic is traffic you know how, how is that going to be handled because I know people all, anytime there's a new development people always say oh but it's going to make traffic terrible so one of the things that was kind of different in the way this project was put through the process it's being done through a 9212 act but in, it's different than the sequel uh, process but he put in all the, different, um, all the different stuff that we needed to analyze in order to come to different conclusions on all of our codes, ordinances, and growth management. Obviously, one of those was traffic. Mm -hmm. And when you ask our traffic engineers and the people who have studied this, who were hired by the city, they all will tell you that traffic will be better with his mitigation than if there was no project at all. Okay. Very interesting. And there's studies that have been done on that. Yes. So there's data people can look up. Yes. So let's take that just to the next step. There's also other businesses on Cannon Road. There's Car Country, there's Carltus and the North 40, and there's Legoland and the Sheraton Hotel. 
all of those people have huge, huge investments. They have also looked at the traffic analysis and find it to be quite satisfactory. Okay, okay, understandable. Now, uh, as far as the voting is concerned, I'm really interested in this aspect of it. You know, when will we know for sure whether this has passed or not? What, what date and time? February 23rd, hopefully, if not, first thing the 24th. Okay, first thing the 24th. I won't hold you to the 23rd then. Let's say first thing on the 24th, we'll know yes. of February this year, 2016, we will know whether this passed or not. And it's an open vote for people who are who live in the city of Carlsbad. Is that correct? You must be a registered voter in order to vote. Okay. And people can do that via absentee ballot or via the polling places just like usual. Yes, just like a normal election. Okay. Um, is there any reason, Mr. Mayor, why this shouldn't uh, why, why, why someone should vote no on this? I have really sat back and tried to uh, look at it from the opposition side. And when you think of it from an environmental perspective, this is a home run. I mean, 176 acres and a $16 million enhancement. Um, he's going to take the land and put it into an endowment or into a trust and fully endow the project um, in perpetuity. Um, there's just so much from an environmental standpoint that's a plus. The traffic, obviously everybody's concerned about the traffic and you know our staff and the consultants all say it's going to work. It's almost 10 million dollars in traffic mitigation. And then, I mean, there's, there's the shopping experience which is going to be a one of a kind in this county. Okay. So, Mr. Carlsbad, do you have any questions for the mayor? Uh, no. Okay, we got it all covered then. Um, so, obviously, the big question is for the residents in Carlsbad, sp specifically the homeowners. Yes. Um, will there be a benefit to a project like this if there's a huge development and a new big mall there with the Nordstroms and all that stuff mm -hmm. and a, a world class ex shopping experience right. and dining as well? Uh, does that help the real estate values, or can homeowners expect to see a spike in values because of that? So uh, let me let me first say that uh, I really encourage uh, anyone who's going to be voting to not necessarily make their vote based on what I'm about to say because home values can go up, they can go down. I don't want someone to come back to me and say, well, I voted for this and my home <laughs> value did not go up. So uh, that could be a problem. Um, I also encourage registered voters to um, look at both sides to make sure that they're making an educated uh judgment educated vote based on the information that they research not necessarily what we talk about they need to do that for themselves okay that being said um, i did a lot of uh research myself specifically on real estate because that's the biggest question i get as a realtor is okay how is this going to affect my home's value and i actually have a cousin who lives up in los angeles and he's also an agent and he lives near the grove which is a project that uh, caruso the developer for this project did about 12 or 14 years ago. And he said that home values increased over there. Um, a little different situation because it's more walkable. Um, I think when we look at home values, we first look at homes right around a project. Are they gonna go up or are they gonna go down? Well, if it's a walkable project, they might go up. But if it's a home that is behind a gas station that comes up, maybe that's not so good. It's a little different in this case because we're not gonna have homes right abutting the project. So now we have to look at homes in the general area and then homes a little further away. And I think in the short term, uh, it may be troublesome as far as traffic just because of construction going on. But in the long run, I think that close by the project, you're gonna see home values likely increase. The reason why, and when, when I'm working with a home buyer and we whittle down their list of needs and wants in a home, usually it comes down to if they have kids, it's schools, and then proximity to shopping. Yeah. And if they're close to shopping, that's a plus for them. And this is gonna be high-end shopping. The other benefit that I think some people don't look at is there's going to be a lot more tax dollars coming into the city with a project like this. Well, if the city has more tax dollars, they can put it back into uh, schools, parks, other things that will raise home values, maybe not right around the project, but I live about five miles away in Carlsbad from where this is going to be. And it may positively affect my value based on what the city can do with that money. Gotcha. So again, back to the first thing I said, don't cast your vote based on what, what I'm saying, um, but some of the research I've done, generally speaking, a project like this would increase home values around the area. Yeah, which makes sense because ultimately what increases home values is desirability. Right. And when you have more access to things that people want, like shopping, dining, mm -hmm. and things like that, then that increases desirability. Plus you have people coming from probably Orange County now, Oceanside, that would be coming to a project like this. 
and that would just create more buzz about Carlsbad. You already have Legoland and some of the other things, so it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back in that regard. Right. Someone would say, all right, we got to move to Carlsbad. Right. You know, and of course that's demand, which causes prices to go up. And that's typically how the equation works. So I've I've been unsuccessful in trying to poke a hole in this thing, Mr. <laughs> Mayor, but uh, you've given us some great information. Same of course, <laughs> you know, research online for yourself and make sure you vote Carlsbadians because that's the only way you, your voice can be heard. Thank you guys so much for being here, Mr. Carlsbad, or Mr. Mayor, thank you for being <laughs> here. Mr. Carlsbad, <laughs> Mr. Mayor of Carlsbad, <laughs> Mr. Carlsbad, thank you guys so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else, commercial free. Our next guest on Smart to San Diego TV is our downtown community correspondent. Please welcome back to the show the life of the party, Nicole Hazelton, and her special guest, president of Urban Discovery Academy, Malin Levine. All right, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, Nicole, this is all about <laughs> families who are looking to live in downtown but aren't aware of some of the schooling options. Um, the thoughts of like, well, where are my kids going to go to school? We really want to live downtown. We want to be in the middle of the action. There's so much going on in there. It's such a cool place to live. I lived there for five years. It was so awesome. We can't wait to get back. Um, but a lot of people don't know about the schooling options there. So you wanted to bring Maine Linen today. Right, I did, because the Urban Discovery Academy is a charter kindergarten through eighth grade school in the East Village. And they're really all about um, making innovative learning opportunities and um, having interaction with the students within the community and I think it's just so important for buyers that are looking to purchase within a community to know what their options are especially for families even if they don't have children yet right yeah. yes because people have that in the plans right. so Maylin now you guys <laughs> yes. have a new facility now right you moved we did recently yes we're so fortunate to have been able to because of our success over the last eight years we were able to um, finance eleven and a half million dollar um, project in downtown. So we acquired a plot at 14th and F that incorporates a historic two-story brick building and then we added on to the brick building another almost 20,000 square feet of new addition, oh, new construction. Smokes. It's beautiful. How did you guys pull that I off? I don't know. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I think we, we say that we live like this blessed um, you know, life, this this little school, that things just tend to work out. Um, lots and lots of hard work, but um, we're just really lucky that we, we were able to meet the right people at the right time who knew this process of how to yeah. do financing and just real estate out. development. I was gonna say, because that is a big project. It's a big project. Especially and for a charter school. Right. Right? I mean, it's not like you guys are, are swimming in cash. You right. had, I mean, you really had to figure it out. We did. Yeah, and we're one of very few charter schools that only have a single site that was able to qualify for that kind of bond financing. So it's really, you know, a tribute to the board's ability to to govern um, the school and, and keep control over finances for the first seven years that we're able to, to qualify for that. So, so it's K through eight, mm -hmm. so kindergarten through eighth grade. And uh, how many students are there at the school? Um, we have 438 this year. We'll add another classroom, another eighth grade class next year. So we'll be full at 472, I believe, next year. <sighs> okay, um, very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Now, is there plans for more expansion from that point? Actually, yes. Just as of uh, Friday night, our board agreed to pursue um, adding a high school to our charter. Wow. So this week, as a matter of fact, we're submitting our charter revision to San Diego Unified, requesting permission to add the ninth through 12th grade. So how does the charter school work for people who don't know necessarily understand that? Uh, what's the difference between a charter school and you know going to, through San Diego Unified? So essentially the money from the state and the federal government for education follows the student. So a charter school is independent from the district, although we're authorized by the district to have a charter. Hmm. So it's a, yeah, it's a confusing, complicated relationship, um, but essentially the money follows the student. So rather than the money going to the district and then get it getting disseminated to the individual school site, 
our money comes directly from the state. And mm -hmm. so the charter schools have to manage their own budget. Um, they have their own board of trustees, each charter. Um, they hire their director, and then the director hires the staff. So it's it's a 501c3. It's a um, you know a nonprofit entity, um, and so it's an either sink or swim scenario. You've asked for the permission to govern yourself and manage the money and get the students, hire the teachers, and then. You know, you hopefully have you to, can do it. And you do it have well. to do it, and you right. guys have been successful because it was—it's hard to get in, <laughs> right, is. to your to your school it um, is. because it's so desirable in the area. I know we uh, we tried to get Maya in there, and we lived downtown, and we actually got her in at the last second, and some unfortunate events we couldn't do it. Um, but it was it was very desirable, and there was mm -hmm. and there was a list to get in. So it's great that you're expanding. And so what you're saying is that the money follows the students, meaning if you have more students, then right. you'll get more funding. Exactly, and we were maxed out at this building site. We can't actually because our charter and, and our philosophy is that we want the classroom size to stay small. Um, so we have two grades from kinder through eighth grade. And, and once we add the eighth grade next year, that's as much expansion as we can do on that particular site. So the high school will have to be located at another location. And we're looking for that location right now. So are charter schools more like private schools then, as far as how the educational process is organized? Or is it more like... Yes and no. So okay. the charter school movement, the charter schools sort of live this precarious place between a private entity. They act sort of like a private entity sometimes with the 501c3. But then we're also, you know, the curriculum has to follow Common Core, mm. um, state state testing, all of those things. So we, we abide by the, the regulations and the rules uh, dictated by the state of California. But we have leeway in how the school decides and the teachers decide to get the students there. Gotcha. Okay, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Nicole, how does this play into the downtown scene as far as, you know, we're talking about families mm -hmm. moving into downtown. <coughs> does this add a lot of value to the community? Absolutely it does. I think the Urban Discovery Academy has been a huge success for the properties that are in the East Village surrounding that area. And it's just that we have a shortage of three bedroom units in downtown in general, and that's what most parents with children are looking for. Mm -hmm. So you do have Ballpark Village that's coming. That's a rental community over by the ballpark that will have three bedrooms. Pinnacle on the Park is a rental community that offers three bedrooms, and Strata, which is a little bit more of an upscale community. Does 13th and Market Lamp. have three bedrooms? 13th and Market is limited to two. Okay. Um, but there are other communities residential for sale, like Union Square that has three bedrooms mm -hmm. and the 450000 price point. There's one there active now. Um, so it's very limited. <laughs> and I mean, with the millennial population, you have millennials that are overtaking the population of baby boomers this year. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're growing exponentially. It's the age group from 18 to 34. They're going to be deciding to have children. Studies have shown that millennials like to be in an urban environment. They're going to want to live, work, play, and raise their children in the same community. So really, I think it's time for the developers to start looking at that for the future of downtown. And I know a lot of, a lot of that's what the downtown mm -hmm. partnership is doing with the Idea District, but making those communities accessible for schools like the Urban Discovery Academy. So Maylin, for people like me who plan mm -hmm. on living downtown and plan on having children and who want to go to UDA, how do we do that? So it's a lottery system. So you have to get your application in soon. They will choose, the lottery will happen on Friday, I believe, March 18th, if that's a Friday. Okay, and you get uh, extra bonus, right, if you live in downtown. Yes, the, the lottery is weighted for folks who live in downtown, and siblings first, but then um, double weighted if you live in the downtown footprint. Okay, well fantastic. Well, if you don't live in the downtown footprint and you want to, Call Nicole Hazelton. She's our downtown <laughs> expert. She will hook you up like a tow truck. Thank you guys so much for coming in today. Thank really you. appreciate your Thank time. Thank you. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else, commercial free. Our next guest is the Managing Director for the San Diego Financial Literacy Center, 
Please welcome to the show for the first time, Brad Pagano. He's here. All right. Brad, what's up, man? What's going on, Derek? How you doing, brother? I'm doing very well, thank you. Great to have you here today. Uh, when I first heard about the SDFLC, I was just like, oh, that, yeah. that's what I've been wanting to do my whole life. Yeah. Right? Like, this is my dream that this exists. Tell people what it is. Well, the SDFLC is a comprehensive program, and what we do is we use personal finance through workshops, seminars, and one-on-one -on -one consultations to help individuals increase their financial fitness. Um, too often, we're finding that young people, military, and low income, that they don't have the base knowledge in order to make smart financial decisions, and they end up making dumb mistakes and they're not smarter than everybody else. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's what we do here. That's so right. If they watch the show. Yeah. Uh, guarantee it. <laughs> uh, that is my guarantee. Uh, so with the SD SDFLC, San Diego Financial Literacy Center, mm -hmm. um, you guys, when you say seminars, mm -hmm. workshops, and things like that, basically what you're doing is you're teaching people how all this stuff works. Basically what you don't learn in school. Correct. You're not taught in school about how money works, about how finances work and managing all of that stuff, because you have to manage it, right? Right. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to financial literacy. A lot of people equate financial literacy to working with indigent people, poor people, people that just don't understand. However, financial literacy affects everyone. So in school, they've removed a lot of the fundamental uh, education around personal finance. So we work from the very mundane, budgeting, to the very intricate, leaving a legacy, and everything in between, but how they all correlate. So how budgeting, correlates to understanding your credit, how that co understands to, how that correlates to buying a home, buying a business, buying a car, investing. So there's uh, definitely steps that we work in, but fundamentally it's about building a plan and sticking to the plan and teaching people how to be smarter with their money. Yeah, yeah, and the plan is the, the key to yes. everything. You gotta have a plan for this stuff because mm -hmm. it's so easy if you don't to look in your account and go, wow, we're doing great. Let's spend a little money. Let's go shopping. Let's go out to eat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then a couple bills come out, auto draft, and you go, man. Oh, I forgot about what, that. What, whoa, <laughs> what happened? So it's easy for those things uh. to happen if you don't have a plan put together, which is one big thing for you guys. Okay? Yeah, and putting the plan together is the first step. A lot of the things that we work on are predicating on attacking the delta, which is if you get an increase in your revenue, don't bring your expenses up. Have a plan for that change in revenue to develop a savings or an emergency plan. Did you know that about 56% of Americans don't have $400 in their emergency savings account? If something happened, a car or refrigerator, 56% of Americans, and even more here in San Diego, don't have enough money to handle a $400 emergency expense. And that's part of the plan we talk about. You need to plan for the unexpected, for the what if. In life, IF is in the middle. The if in life will happen, you have to try to plan for it. Yeah, very, very true. And there's other stats too that'll blow your mind about the average retiree's savings accounts, which is, it's terrible. I mean, Google it if you really want to see it, but yeah. uh, it's something you've got to really pay attention to. One of the things you guys are doing, the FFP. Yes. Tell us about the FFP. Well, the Foundation for Financial Planning, based out of Georgia, they had a national release of a grant, and their idea was to create a program for at-risk populations in which we're focusing on military, low-income, 50-plus students, uh, as well as uh, Spanish-speaking. And the idea, we want to put them in a room with certified financial planners and certified financial um, educators and provide them one hour complimentary confidential workshops or one-on-ones where they can ask any question and, build, and start to build their financial plan. Too often, people find that meeting with a financial planner is either A, too expensive, or B, something they don't need to do. And what we're doing is removing that uh, myth and saying you do need to meet with a financial planner regardless of how much money you have. And if you start now, start early, you're going to be able to build that plan and effectuate it as you uh, move through age. So when uh, so your target demographics are really sort of everybody. I mean, yes. you're, this is for everyone. Well, as a nonprofit, we're open to the public, but the programs uh, that we have really focus on low to moderate income, and we consider that below $100,000. San Diego is very expensive, so if you have less than $100,000 AGI as a household, you need to come see us, mm -hmm. as well as military, active, transitioning veteran, their spouses and children. And then, of course, we work in the youth program uh, as young as six and all the way through 24 or grad school. So we're trying to touch as many people as we can with our educational platforms because the more that people know, the better off they're going to be. No question about it. I know Absolutely. Chase has been going to the schools, right? Yeah, and we've got about 170 partners, school districts uh, from Fallbrook all the way down to uh, the border, uh, community colleges. And this FFP project, this Foundation for Financial Planning project, is really going to give us the 
the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one collective impact that we need and start to really fundamentally change the way some of these people think about how their plans are being built. And that to us is going to be able to provide outcomes that show what we're doing is important and how we're doing it is really working. Yeah, and it's such a crucial thing to get into people's minds early on. Yes. Because we all form habits. The question is just, are they good or are they bad? I mean, we all have habits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all have routines. There's things that we just all do. So are those good for you or are they not good for you? So developing those good habits, financial habits of sort of second guessing things mm -hmm. or checking things, double checking things, making a plan, uh, making sure that you know where your money is going, mm -hmm. making sure that you are saving something. Yes. Because even if you're just saving 50 bucks a month. Right you are making progress. Right. I think it, that's an important message. For well, we always preach so pay yourself first. So 10%, save 10% of what you can. And unfortunately and fortunately, we have this beautiful thing called the internet and smartphones. And everybody knows everything on the internet is true, right? So a lot of what we're doing is either uh, reinforcing uh, something they've learned from a family member or a friend or from school, but a lot of it is debunking myths. A lot of the information out there, um, maybe not wrong, but it's not right for them. And so they, they, I heard this from this person, and this is what I want to do with my money. So they're using information that is good for somebody else, but not good for them. So everything has to be clear, concise, comprehensive, and culturally competent. So you have to take the time to educate yourself and then continue to educate yourself. Personal finance is not a one-shot deal. You know, go learn how to do personal finance and that's it. Continually educating yourself, continually seeking resources and opportunities to do so is very important. Acquire the knowledge, apply the knowledge, officially become smarter than everyone else. Brad Pagano, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming and all the great work you guys are doing in the community. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate you having me. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else commercial free. Great show, guys. That's a wrap. Jade, uh, what's your schedule look like? Do you mind breaking down the set? Uh, not today, Derek. I'd love to, but there's waves out there. I gotta go. Angela? Nikki? Uh, yeah, I gotta go beat traffic. And I think Nikki's making something up there. Look at this. We did this. We did all of this.